In the last video I discussed some of the difficulties that come with measuring the current of a DCC signal and why an occasional readout of the DCC-X current values is not providing meaningful results. Today I show how I implemented current gauges for main and broke track of DCC-X that work reasonably or should I say surprisingly well. Welcome to the IOTT channel, I am Hans Tanner. To get started, let me give you a quick demonstration of how they work. I am using an Arduino Uno with a power shield and a Red Hat shield with IOTT stick on top of it. As throttle I am using a smartphone with engine driver, which connects via Wi-Fi to the IOTT stick. And to answer a question I hear once in a while, Yes, of course, the Red Hat can be used without any LocoNet equipment connected to it. Technically, it upgrades DCC-X to a LocoNet command station with sockets to connect LocoNet equipment, but you can run it entirely via Wi-Fi, either using engine driver as I do here, or by throttle, or a computer running JMRI or other software. The Arduino stack is powered from a lab power supply with about 12 volts and we can see the current display showing 160 milliamps, which is the current consumption of the Arduino, the motor shield and the IoTT stick, all powered from one single power source. The outputs of the Arduino motor shield are connected to my track oval. One half of it is powered from the main track output, the other half from the program track output. On the PC we see the Red Hat configuration page as explained in detail in video number 101, but in the meantime I have added a new monitor tab and if I click on it I get two current gauges, one for the main track and one for the proc track. For the moment, current reporting is working with the standard Arduino motor shield, but I am working towards making it functioning with other power drivers as well, first and foremost with the IBT2, which is one of the most economic solutions for high current applications like a G-scale command station. So stay tuned, subscribe to the IoTT channel and hit the bell icon so you don't miss any future videos about this topic. I start running the locomotive from Y throttle and we see the current meter of the proc track half the locomotive is sitting on going up. When the locomotive enters the main track half of the oval, the current display of the proc track half goes back to zero and the current is shown on the main track gauge. Note that there is a certain time delay until the full change of value is shown in the display. This of course is because of the low sampling rate of only 10 measurements per second as explained in the last video. But other than that, the results of the measurement clearly are correlated with the values shown on the amp meter of the power supply. How good is the measurement? Here we see the milliamp curves of the Red Hat display compared to the display on the amp meter of the power supply corrected by the 160 milliamp base current for the Arduino stack. As you can see, the deviation depends on the speed step and the decoder type. The biggest deviation is for a low frequency decoder at the low speed step. There, the Red Hat display shows almost twice the current we see on the display of the power supply. The higher the speed step and the higher the frequency of the PWM signal of the decoder, the better the values converge. And here is the curve for an ohmic resistor. No surprise, in this case the two curves are practically identical, which is a confirmation that the data sampling works and the conversion calculations are correct. I will explain in a minute why there is this deviation on low speed steps and how it can be reduced. But already now I think the quality of the measurement is good enough to let us have a pretty clear idea about the current consumption of each track section powered from DCC-X. So after what I discussed in the last video, how DCC-X is sampling current, how is it even possible that we get a current measurement that apparently works? <laughs> 
Let me explain it to you, but be warned, it is going to be a little bit technical and maybe you want to grab a coffee before continuing watching. Let's get started by having another look at the signal form of the PWM pulse of the DH84 decoder I used in the last video. This decoder uses a 60Hz PWM frequency, which means it is pulsing the motor with a current spike that repeats every 16.6 milliseconds. The T tau ratio or duty cycle of the signal changes with the speed step. Now, if we want to measure the current of that signal, say with a resolu resolution of 100 increments, we need to sample the signal 100 times during the period and determine how many times it was on. So we have to sample 100 times in 16.6 milliseconds, which amounts to a sampling rate of 6000 samples per second. Compare this to the 10 samples per second DCCX is actually doing. With the supersonic decoder it is even worse. Here. The period of the PWM signal is 62 microseconds and if we want to have a resolution of 100 steps from standstill to full speed, we are looking at a sampling rate of 1.6 million samples per second. Again, compare this to the sampling rate of DCCX which is 10 samples per second and you conclude that there is no way we can ever get a precise enough value for the duty cycle and with that for the current consumption of a high frequency PWM decoder. The DCCX team, as you may know, is currently working on improving the way how DCCX is reading the analog inputs. Instead of running them from the main loop, they will become part of the 58 microsecond interrupt that drives the DCC signal. They will support up to 16 analog pins and basically cycling through them one pin every interrupt tick. So in the best case with only one analog input pin it is sampled every 58 microseconds which amounts to a sampling rate of about 17 kilo samples per second. And we already can predict that this will not be fast enough to sample the current of a 16 kHz decoder. The best we can expect from that sampling rate is to read whether the duty cycle is above or below 50%. Not good enough for current measuring. Nevertheless, of course, this is a very promising development which will help greatly, but for other reasons than the sampling rate as we will see later in this video. I did quite some testing over the last few weeks to find out what minimum sampling rate is needed to analyze the current signal in real time and achieve meaningful readings. I did that using an ESP32 along with an IBT2 H-bridge driver and I will probably do a separate video about that in the future. In a nutshell it starts to look good with a sampling rate of about 30 kilo samples per second, preferably higher. And for the moment we just can conclude that any sampling rate that is achievable on the DCCX Arduino platform is not good enough to accurately measure the current and we need to find another way to do it. And in fact, as you have seen in the demonstration, it seems to be possible, at least with some limitations. Here is how it works. The key insight is that the PWM signal of the decoder is a periodic signal that does not change as long as the speed step of the decoder remains the same. It keeps repeating with the PWM frequency of the decoder. Let's use the DH84 as an example. It has a PWM frequency of 60 Hz or a period of 16.6 milliseconds as just discussed. If I sample this signal every 100 milliseconds, this is what happens. I take the first sample right at the beginning of the PWM pulse. Then I wait 100 milliseconds. In this time, the decoder generates five more pulses, which I completely miss, but when the sixth pulse comes along, I am ready to sample again. Now, theoretically, the period of the 60 Hz PWM is exactly one sixth of the sampling rate, so I would always measure at the very same position of the signal. In reality, however, there is always a certain deviation. 
Either the 60 Hz PWM frequency of the decoder is slightly less or more than 60 Hz, like in the case of my DH84 it is 61.7 Hz. Or the timing of the sampling rate shifts by a few clock cycles due to interrupts or functions called in the program main loop. In this Arduino plotter printout we can see the timing of the analog read function. As we see the time between two samples varies between 98,600 and 100,800 microseconds, and in some cases even more. And the average frequency seems to be slightly faster than 10 Hz. Overall the stability of the sampling rate of DCCX is not very good, and as we will understand in a minute, contributes to the measuring errors we see. But, as a result of these frequency differences, we get a certain phase shift of the PWM pulse with respect to the sampling point. To make this phase shift visible, I added some digital pin commands to DCCX. As you see in the code segment here, I am setting pin 6 high before the analog read function is started, and then back to zero after it terminates. I then connect pin 6 to channel 2 of the oscilloscope and set the trigger of the oscilloscope to that channel. So what we get on the screen is a brief pulse that refreshes every time DCCX reads the analog input, which is about every 100 milliseconds, and it can be seen as a red pulse with a duration of about 30 microseconds. Then I connect the current signal input from the motor shield to channel 1 of the scope, and when I send a speed command to the locomotive, the PWM pulse we already know from the last video appears and gets wider if I increase the speed steps. And most importantly, as predicted, it has a continuous lateral shift with reference to the sampling point. So now, with that phase shift, if I keep measuring, say, for 50 samples, I am effectively doing a scan of the signal at 50 different points, which are more or less equally spread out over the entire period of the signal. We can easily see that if we just imagine the signal is stable. Then the first measurement takes place at a specific point, and the next measurement with some distance from it, then the next with the same distance, and so on. If the end of the signal is reached, it starts again. If we sample 50 points on this 60 Hz signal, the total sampling points are distributed over the entire period, and the result is equal to sampling the same signal just once, with a sampling rate of 3000 samples per second. And it is equivalent to analyzing the duty cycle with a resolution of 50 steps from zero to full speed. Not exactly high resolution, but not too bad either and most importantly, feasible with a low sampling rate of 10 samples per second within a time span of only 5 seconds because the PWM signal is periodic and repeats itself over and over again. Next, let's have a look at what happens if I use the supersonic decoder with 16 kHz PWM frequency. This signal has a much shorter period of only 62 microseconds, so if I do 50 measurements as before, I get 50 samples, which also are equally distributed over the entire period of the signal, but since the period is only 62 microseconds, I am effectively running a sampling rate of 800 kilo samples per second. That sounds impressive, but of course the signal is much faster, and therefore, also in this case, I am getting a resolution of 50 steps for the PWM range from zero to full speed. In the case I show here, it is even worse, because the decoder is using back EMF, which means there is a measuring break of 2 milliseconds after 8 milliseconds of operation, which means the period of the resulting compound signal is about 10 milliseconds and the sampling rate therefore decreases to about 5 kilo samples per second. Still not bad though. Something similar happens if we operate two or more locomotives on the same track. In this case, the two or more periodic signals are superpositioned to form a new compound signal, 
which is also periodic and the resulting period is the smallest common multiple of the individual signals. With my two decoders here, it turns out to be about 160 milliseconds, mainly because of the back EMF pause. And if we do 50 measurements as before, we get a sampling rate of about 312 samples per second. However, since large portions of the signal consist of the high frequency pulses of the supersonic decoder, we have a good statistical chance that the sampling points hit values proportionally to the real distribution of the values. And in fact, even in this case, the resulting measured current is close to the sum of the currents of the individual decoders. Now, the question is, how can this information be converted to a current measurement? The correct way to do that is calculating the current that, if applied constantly, would deliver the same energy to the motor like the measured signal. It turns out this is the so-called root mean square or short RMS value. So all we need to do is summing up the squared values of each sample, divide the result by the number of samples and then calculate the square root, which is the resulting current. The key to success thereby is a constant sampling rate which allows me to scan the current signal of the decoder despite a low sampling rate over a certain number of periods and coming up with a scan of the entire signal shape thanks to the phase shift that results from frequency differences of the sampled signal and the sampling points. The precision of the measurement is only determined by the number of samples I include in the RMS calculation, as is the reaction time. Unfortunately, the two work against each other. A high number of samples means higher precision of the measured value, but it takes longer until I have the final result. A lower number of considered samples means faster reaction if the current changes, but lower resolution of the signal scan and therefore higher fluctuation of the measured value. In the example I showed you, I used 30 samples as calculation base and in my opinion, this results in a quite acceptable display on the current meter with only limited fluctuation and moderate reaction time to current changes. And a good part of the fluctuation certainly is caused by the relatively instable sampling rate we get from DCCX. So that's the basic methodology to measure a reasonable current despite the low sampling rate provided by the DCCX command station and here again the key elements to make it successful. First, sampling needs to take place at the constant rate. In the case of DCCX it is 100 milliseconds as given by the published source code. Faster would be better but more important is the stability of the rate as this makes for a continuous phase shift of the sampling point and the periodic signal to be measured. And therein currently lays the main problem. As we have seen, the time between two sample points fluctuates between 98,600 and 100,800 microseconds, so a difference of up to 2.2 milliseconds, which is a lot if we try to sample the signal from a supersonic decoder. And even when sampling a 60 Hz PWM low frequency decoder at a low speed step, it can make the difference whether we hit or miss the peak. So I think here we have basically the reason for the fluctuation of the values and possibly also for the too high values when running low speed steps. And second, the resulting current is the RMS value of a specified number of most recent samples. Meaningful results start with consideration of about 30 samples. The more samples that are considered, the higher the stability of the result, but at the cost of slower reaction to changes of value. That's it, so let's now think about the implementation. The first challenge to do the sampling with a constant rate is more or less solved by the DCCX implementation, which samples the track current of both the main and the probe track every plus minus 100 milliseconds. 
Of course, I would like to see the tolerances to be smaller, but for the time being, that's what it is. The next question is, what do we do with the data? There are two alternative concepts. Process it on DCCX or send them to the IoT stick for buffering and processing. The advantages of processing the data on the DCCX hardware is of course that then the resulting current value is available on the Arduino. The disadvantage on the other hand is that it consumes memory and computing power from an already not very powerful hardware. Sending the raw data to another device, in my case the IoT stick, but it also could be JMRI for example, would mean to send two values every tenth of a second, which at first looks like a lot of data to be transferred, but given the speed of the serial interface, really is no big deal. And of course it has the advantage that the data can be processed on a much more powerful device. I implemented both ways to try them out and both solutions worked with no problem. But the developer of DCCX had some concerns about using floating point data types which have been banned from DCCX for performance reasons, but are difficult to avoid when doing rolling averages and square roots as needed for the RMS calculation. I therefore decided to skip the approach and focus on processing the data on the IoT stick. So I added some code to DCCX to send the data to the IoT stick and on the stick itself I implemented a ring buffer that keeps a configurable number of the most recent values but already squared. On the Red Hat Shield web page I added two gauges, one for each track, and the communication routine that requests new data from the stick about once per second. If the request is received by the stick, it simply cycles over the ring buffer, adding all the values and calculating the resulting RMS value to be sent to the gauge. For the configuration, I have added some new options to the Red Hat Shield configuration screen. There is a new paragraph labeled Current Measurement Settings. The checkboxes let you select what current gauges are shown on the monitor tab. If none of them is checked, the monitor tab is hidden altogether. Buffer size determines how many of the most recent values will be considered for the RMS calculation. The default setting is 40, but you can change as you wish. Multiplier is a scaling factor to correct the calculated values if they are systematically too high or too low. Max value specifies the maximum value of the gauge. It is for both gauges, you cannot set them individually at this time. And the major ticks field lets you specify what ticks will show on the gauge. This field is for both gauges as well. If you click the monitor tab, you see the selected gauges. They are labeled main and prog depending on the track current that is displayed on the gauge. The value is always set in milliamps. Note that these new features are only available with software version 1517 or higher. You may have to upgrade your IoT stick to make it work. A link to download the latest version is in the description below. To make it work, you will also have to make modifications to the DCCX software. I have submitted a pull request with the changes and the developer okayed it from a technical point of view. However, I have no idea about how long it will take until the sample data exporting feature will end up in either the development version or the official release of DCCX. We will see when something becomes available on the DCCX download page. In the meantime, I provide the source code for my modifications as well as a ready-made installation file on the IoTT webpage. The link is in the description below as well. And that's it for this video. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you and you are eager to try out this new feature for yourself. If so, please click the like button below to let me know.
It does not cost you anything and it helps to promote this video and the IOTT channel in general. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.